Welcome back to the Don't Stop Me Now podcast. I am your host, Jennifer Vaughn. Thank you for joining me again. Honestly, it's been really fun lately getting back into the swing of podcasting again. And I want to quickly give a shout out, a shout out, um, well, or a big thank you, a thank you to my guests last week, Ashley and Jim, for taking the time to come on my podcast and share their very private experience with HIV disclosure. So their story got a lot of people talking online. I love that. And it really helped open up more eyes about what it means today to be living with HIV and having the freedom to love how you want or have sex how you want, right? Or as Ashley put it, to have a normal sex life. So just a quick reminder for those that are new to my podcast podcast and don't know this information, it's called U equals U or undetectable equals untransmittable, meaning when someone living with HIV, like myself, that's on treatment and undetectable, they can't transmit the virus to their sexual partner. Like they can't at all. Like it's impossible. So, and that means no condoms. A lot of people ask that. Does that still mean you have to wear a condom? Does that mean the partner still has to be on prep? No, it does not. It means that they will not get HIV from you. I cannot speak for all the other STIs, but HIV won't happen. And it also doesn't prevent pregnancy. <laughs> be aware of that. So this information is only pertaining to HIV. Google the partner study. If you have more questions, there's several studies that took part in this research. Or better yet, you can go to preventionaccess.org forward slash FAQ and you'll find all the answers to your questions about U equals U or undetectable equals untransmittable. Also, Jim's reaction to Ashley having HIV was so refreshing and very mature. You know, he said he was relieved when she told him about her status. Um, you'll have to listen to hear why, but clearly it's not the reaction most people would expect when having to drop a bomb like this. Although truly with today's meds, the disclosure of one's HIV status to a potential love interest should be more like dropping a, seriously, like a ping pong ball. It's just literally something to know about the person, but it does not have the weight originally associated with it, medically speaking. You know what I mean? So, okay. So before we get to our guest today, I have a couple little stories that I'd like to share. Okay. I'm just going to get this out of the way right now. So it's a sin on HBO Max. Yes, I've seen it. It's so funny how many people will write to me when something like this comes out um, and they think like, yeah, I've got to watch it. Well, to be quite honest, just because I have HIV doesn't mean I want to watch all the movies about HIV. I think I honestly had more interest in movies about HIV before I had it. Now I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I don't really care. So, I mean, I saw Dallas Buyers Club by myself in a little independent theater. And um, I had it at that time because I know when I watched the movie, when it had come out and I didn't know that I had HIV at that moment, I'm watching this movie and like to look back on that and go, oh my God, I was sitting there in the theater having these feelings for this poor man. And like, I'm sitting there with it in my body and had no clue. Like that to me is so crazy. But what I would really like to see, honestly, is a movie about U equals U. Let's see a movie about someone living with HIV today and what it is today and all the stigma that still goes with this virus that shouldn't be there and show what it is for somebody living with it where they can actually have a totally normal relationship and show them all the stigma that they still have to live with for absolutely no reason. That's what I want to see. Let's talk about what it is today. Let's put that out there because I don't see that. I don't see big movies about that today. I see just talking about how bad it was. I don't know why we have to keep going back to how bad it was. Let's talk about how much better it is now. Really, that's what they need to focus on. <clears throat> okay. A funny thing that happens to me is I have to go into my YouTube channel a lot for whatever reason, obviously. And when I click on my channel, sometimes my welcome video will pop up right away because that's just what happens. And I cannot stand that beginning part where I hear myself say, welcome to my channel. Welcome to my channel. Welcome to my channel. Welcome to my channel. My name's Jennifer and I'm HIV positive. I can't stand it. I cannot tell you how quickly I go for the mute button before it plays out loud, especially if someone else is in the room. I don't want to hear my voice. I've heard that video a gazillion times. It's so funny. It's so triggering for me. It's like nails on a chalkboard. I cannot tell you how quickly I go for the mute button or pause because I see it coming. It's like I hear the little intro to the music. It's like, no, I don't want to hear it. I don't usually watch my videos and I watch them like right after I make them. 
Um, but it's really, really rare for me to go back and watch any of my videos. I just don't, it's, you know, like anybody that knows that if they record themselves, it's, you don't want to keep going back and watching it. It's kind of okay when it's fresh and brand new and you just put it out, but you, I don't know. I just, after a while and it sits there, it's like, you kind of are like afraid to open it up to see what you said or look like, or, you know, any of that. So I, yeah, I don't watch my old videos, but that welcome video, it comes up all the time. I just cannot stand it. Okay, so I'm on TikTok all the time, right? And I comment sometimes. And sometimes my comments get viral. You know, whatever. I'll say something funny or witty or whatever. So there was this koala in the video somewhere out on some road in Australia. And this girl videotaped her... Videotaped? We don't say that anymore. This girl filmed her father saving the koala. I guess he had some gloves in his truck or whatever, like leather gloves like you'd use if you were like, you know, having like a bird of prey land on your hand, those big thick gloves. So he goes over to pick it up and I'm thinking, oh, it's just going to like, he's going to pick it up and bring it off the road. No, this thing like fully tried to attack him. It's turning around. He's trying to get it from behind and the thing's turning around with its claws and it's trying to bite him and it's growling. It makes the weirdest growling noise. I have never in my life seen a koala act like this. So I write a comment about this, something to that effect, that I always thought that koalas just hugged and slept. I didn't know that they bit and growled. I cannot tell you how many people decided to go after me because of that comment and tell me how stupid I was that I didn't know it's a wild animal and this is how they act. And this is like, how would you feel if a big giant you know, person came up behind you? I'm like, well, I know I get all that, but I'm sorry, living in the United States, we are not aware of koalas acting this way. All we see is them in sanctuaries and people holding them and them looking really cuddly and cute. I've never, ever seen in my life. I'm 50. I've never seen them react that way. But apparently I've missed all the information about koalas acting like assholes. And there's something about their brains that somebody had written in there about them being smooth and like not a lot of brain matter or something, that they're like the dumbest animal ever. So sad. I don't want to say that about a koala because I think they're really sweet looking. But anyways, um, yeah, there's a lot of information about koalas out there that apparently I'm just completely missing. So I kept this comment going. You know, I was seeing all the notifications and I'd say 25% of them were people just, you know, telling me how dumb I was. And then all of a sudden, a little light bulb went off on my head that I could delete the comment. I don't have to keep taking this abuse. So I went in and deleted my comment because I'm like, you know what? Screw all you. I cannot help it. I, I've never done research on koalas, but that's all I know about them is they look sweet, cuddly, and they sleep a lot. But little did I know they're actually quite vicious and they can be really awful. Okay, so one more story and then we'll get to our guest. So the other day I went for a run with my dog, Finn, and we have a trail that's um, along the water. It's really pretty and there's a lot of wild animals. It's by a slough and um, during my run, and he was off leash, during my run, I come across two little baby ducklings, furry, yellowy, brown, laying next to each other on the trail, just laying there dead. And so I investigate and I go up to them. I'm squatting down and I'm like, I, you know, I touch them. They're little ducks. They're so cute. Turn them over. They each have like a bloody little puncture wound in their belly. And all I could think was like, what? I don't get what's going on here. Like they're laying right next to each other. They're clearly both dead, but something happened to them at the same time. I'm thinking, did somebody shoot them with a BB gun? And they landed next to each other on the trail and I'm thinking no they don't fly yet they're just little babies you know and so I can't figure it out and I you know they're still floppy and warm they had just died so I continue to run along the path and there's this guy walking on the path a ways ahead of me and I had seen him you know before I got to the ducks and I kind of hate passing people when I'm running but anyways I saw it coming I was going to have to pass him and I was going to have to get Finn back on his leash because he can't pass people unless he's on a leash. I'm waiting for Finn to put him back on his leash. He's finally reaching up to me, but he was a ways back behind me. And I get up to this guy and he turns around and he says, hey, did you see that coyote back there? I'm like, what? Uh, no. And I said, oh my God. I said, he's who killed the ducks. And he said, yeah, you were a little bit behind me. He goes, I was walking. And then he goes, I saw the coyote first. And he goes, it like circled by the ducks. And then it went into the high grass. There's high grass on either side of the trail. So here I am squatting down, touching the coyote's prey. Like I'm like short, right? I'm not even standing tall. So I probably look like more of something he could have attacked. 
I don't know why, but he didn't. So, or she didn't. So there's that. I was touching the prey of this coyote that had just died and it was hiding somewhere very close to me. I had no clue. And Finn was off leash way behind me. So he's in that area. He'd even sniff the ducks and I ran away. I'm like, he'll follow me. He's fine. You know, he always follows me. So he was in danger, had zero clue that coyotes were out during the day. I always thought that this was a nighttime thing for them. So I've never worried about Finn being off leash, but clearly, obviously, uh, they're all around the area I live in. Um, I don't know if you, if you listen to my podcast and you've listened since the beginning, you'll know that I had a cat that went missing October 13th of 2020 and he's never come home when he had, you know, he's chipped. He had a collar with my name and number on it. And I'm certain that he was attacked by um, coyotes now because he used to bring me snakes from the slough. And that's like two blocks away. And the only way he could have found snakes is if he went into that area and that's where they are. So um, we're quite certain that that's what happened to our kitty. It's uh, it's very sad. It's I'm better now, but I had a very, very hard time when he went missing. He is, if you look at my Instagram, my animal one, you'll see videos of him, my black and white kitty Sawyer. And, um, you know, we only had him for a year. It was like we had him as a kitten and that was it. He was taken from us a year after we had him. I mean, that was it. We were robbed of our time with him. And um, yeah, that's why my other cats are now all indoors. They don't go out. So anyways, that was a really close call with the coyote. And um, I'm glad that nothing bad happened. But it was a real wake up call to keep Finn on a leash and, you know, keep my eyes really open about what's out there on these trails or maybe just run on the sidewalk. I may just give up the trails altogether. Okay. Our guest today has quite a story when it comes to HIV discrimination because his discrimination came directly from his employer, the United States military. Ken has been fighting this battle since 2008 and is still to this day continuing to fight for his innocence. So much was stripped from this man who gave his heart and soul to the job he loved so dearly. You will love Ken. He's one of the most friendly humans I know, and I'm beyond honored to have him on my podcast to share his unforgettable story. I hear you now. Oh my God. I use this like all day long. And of course, today when I want to talk to a friend, the goddamn thing won't work. <laughs> Look at you. Oh my gosh. I love your background. Thanks. That is so awesome. I don't know what happened. That was crazy. It wasn't a, I don't know if it was my email wasn't working or what, but my gosh, Zoom doesn't usually give me that many problems, but you can hear me okay, yeah? Yeah, 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 I got you. Okay, awesome. How did you do that background? I love that. <laughs> just turn on backgrounds. Oh, and then you just had that set in your, like, your photos? Yeah, I have a bunch of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I need to do more of that. I don't do, um, well, I don't do the audio part just because it's just a podcast. So I, I, oh. I don't let people see me because I'm like in my pajamas right now. Who cares? I, I'd see you. <laughs> I haven't seen you so long. I know. Hold on. Fine. I wasn't prepared. I'm like literally in my jammies. Hold on a second. Let oh, me I'm sorry. Unmute my screen. No, it's fine. I'm in my daughter's like really messy room. Oh, you know what? I had my, I ha- hi. Yay, there you are. I have my, um, I have this little slider that goes over my uh, computer screen, you know, the little yeah. eyeball. And I got that at USCA. They were handing them out. <laughs> you remember that? I don't know if you were there for the one in Florida, but they were handing no. them out. I'm like, oh, I love yeah. that. <laughs> Gosh. So how are you? I'm, I'm okay. It's just, you yeah. know, that's the standard. I'm okay. A roof yeah. over my head. Uh, yep. Um, you know, some things are moving. I had some, some good news. Obviously every day is a struggle, but Definitely. Um, well, yeah. I, you know, the last time we talked, like really talked was in Amsterdam and that was in 2018. And oh what I mostly remember from that trip is horrible jet lag. That was really rough. But um, I remember we did our Facebook live when I interviewed you about your story. <laughs> yeah. And I remember we had to switch sides because I could not hold my phone up in the selfie position much longer. I was like, my my shoulder was killing me. So we switched sides and then we did it from the other side. And I think we just didn't have very, very good connectivity there. And um, I didn't feel like your interview got the justice that it needs. So like, I was really happy that you wanted to do the podcast because I want your story to be clear and I want everyone to know what happened to you because it's so important. Have you yeah. seen the, have you seen the new video from Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation? I have not. <gasps> oh. oh, tell me. No, it's well, so I beat myself up a little hard. Um, when you, yeah, you need to see it. Okay. Yeah. You need to see it. yeah. Um, are, 
are you in it? You know, it's me. It's just me. Oh, okay. Yeah. I need to see that. When 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 did that come out? A few weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago now. Maybe oh, even. okay. Yeah. So is there new information in this that? Well, no, it's, um, so, you know, the, the foundation has just literally um, done this huge commitment to HIV is not a crime. Okay. Um, Robert was first last year and then me. Uh, okay. We're trying to get other folks in. We have uh, another group of survivors working uh, um, kind of like a, like a little delegation of people representing uh, HIV is not a crime. Um, and it's, it, they, they are of course, extremely professionally done. Um, I was lucky because I've been vaccinated since February. Um, they rented the entire WP theater in the city. Um, it was really emotional because it was the first time the theater had been used since last year. You know, Broadway is closed and it's closed until August, I think this year. Mm-hmm. So that was, that was, that was very special, but you know, uh, full, 18 person crew um it it was just amazing you'll see the venues and the vignettes that they strung together to do each one and andy cohen did the voiceover for the pieces in between and when you see me because it's like just a few weeks ago so i'm looking at myself going you know you're a little you're you're a little ragged for 53 but that day i of course had been very stressed out um the screenwriter he, you know, the guy was incredible and just very emotional. As you know, every time, every time we tell our story, it impacts somebody differently. Um, like I love watching you keep telling stories. And of course, people coming after you for just your piece. Well, the criminalized crowd, we get some weird shit. You know, I get the death threats. I get the, you know, burning fire, you know, all kinds of just terrible shit. So I always prepare myself as people hear the story, even though, you know, he was already invested, it was still very emotional. And anyway, so that day I didn't sleep the night before they sent the car up to get me and it was all day. And when you see me, you'll see the difference. You'll see that I I look old, worn out, stressed out, which I am every day. And so I'm glad that I look so ragged. (laughs) Because that's what this does to us every day, you know. Um, it, but it's it's almost three hundred thousand views already. Wow. Okay. So YouTube. Yes, the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation uh, YouTube channels where they they uh, they landed it. Okay. They they put it across uh, multiple platforms. Um, they did their own internal uh, campaign, you know, to donors and things. But publicly, it's on their YouTube channel. Um, yeah, it's, okay. I had one of my, I had one of my high school friends call me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, literally kid I grew up like from birth um, in tears mm. and it was hard. It was very, cause he has been by my side. He it just, Michael's and his wife and the kids and he called me and it's just, cause I told him, I said, Hey, just be ready. It was very hard for me. Mm. I've seen it. And obviously I think I look like shit, but the story <sighs> is, is, is very, is, is pretty powerful. Mm-hmm. And so here's someone, you know, emotionally invested in me and he, they just lost it. So I have not even let my, I haven't let my mother watch it yet. Really? It's, it's, it's I, 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 I'm not saying I hope, but I think because you know me and our friendship, mm-hmm. it'll probably affect you because we're invested in this, this fight and this story. Totally. It, yeah. So yeah, pretty it was, yeah, oh, I can't, I can't watch. Yeah. I can't wait to watch it, and I will do that when we're done. I'm going to watch it yeah. right away. Yeah, and yeah. just for those who don't know, who is Robert? Robert Subtle, um, uh, you know, great dear friend, uh, also criminalized. Robert uh, originally had started out as the deputy uh, director with Ciro, the Ciro project with Sean Strube. Um, Robert just graduated. Uh, yesterday from a uh, great school. I think he got a master's in education. So I'm just so proud of him. Oh, um, yep. Awesome. Yep. Yep. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Cool. I think um, he and I are on Facebook together and he always likes my animal videos. He <laughs> must be a real animal lover. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. funny. That's the only thing he likes. Like I always know <laughs> that Robert's going to like my animal videos. Yeah. It's really sweet. And I think yeah. I met him one time at one of the um, conferences. So yeah, really nice man. So yeah, okay. Well, if you're ready, I want to hear your story again. And so yeah, my sure. Yep. 
So where do you want to start? First of all, you were in the military and obviously yeah. you knew you were gay before you went to the military. I always wonder about that. Like yeah. what made you decide to go into the military and what so branch? It was army. And it's funny you say that. I just had my, my PTSD uh, medical exam. It's another one. Cause if you remember my, when I lost all of my benefits, I've slowly been fighting to get my VA medical benefits back, which I did. Um, mm-hmm. To include, I got my dental back the other day, so I have full benefits back for that. Oh, good. Yep. Yeah, but on the compensation side, um, if you remember, I got injured in the first Gulf and was in in the hospital at Walter Reed for a year of my life. Mm-hmm. And because of the way I was um, court-martialed and kicked out, um, I did not do what, what is generally known as that normal retirement process, where I would have done my VA intake they would have reviewed my medical records of 29 years and all the injuries um i'm now having to go back and you know i call it clean up the battlefield um to get that back but the reason i you asked that the lady uh the psychiatrist who did the interview she asked me about pre-army army and post-army and i came out to myself while i was in the army oh yeah 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 so i'm a late bloomer Oh, um, <laughs> wow. I, you know, I never, or I never really even realized that's a thing. I always think people know when they're like five, you know, and it, they just kind of always know, but you really yeah. don't know. It, it's yeah, no, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't act on it. didn't know anything. Um, you know, there was, I, I did a great family life, great high school life, you know, dated, um, gay girls, my whole, you know, at least child life up until, yeah, I guess, when did I come out to myself? Like it was 20 or you know, 21. I think it was 21. I'm gonna okay. Go back and look at the dates. Um, but yeah, no, I came out when I was in the army, uh, stationed in Germany in the eighties. Um, <laughs> and yes, we're, 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 well, I'm a little older, but we're older. Um, and, uh, it couldn't have been a better experience for me because it was with my best friend. Um, so I, I have like almost, I would call it like fairy tale coming out ish stuff. Was, it, that- was he in the military also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, okay. Same unit. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. So that's and he did he always know that he was gay? Nope. Nope. It was that journey together with <gasps> a little beer with a little beer and off we went. <laughs> wow, that's yeah. that's crazy. Yeah, yeah that's... it was it was it was again, it was, you know, like it, for that best first situation, it, mm-hmm. it was, you know, it was great. So you guys so, obviously had to keep everything completely quiet. Oh my god, yeah. Like I had to remind her when I joined the military, being gay was illegal. Remember that's before Don't Ask, Don't Tell, when it was like, no, we don't want you. You can't serve. So everybody joined living the lie. Um, and we did that deliberately. You know, um, the military is, we're a very tight knit group, especially people stationed overseas. And we're the most nosy SOBs that there are, you know, it's just because we're tight and it's a very unique population and everybody knows everybody and everybody knows everything about everybody else. So, um, yeah, so that was a, that was a, that was a fun journey to go back with her and now with you to recant. How are you able to keep it? Um, wait with her, who are you referring to her? Uh, the psychiatrist the other day when I was saying, oh, okay, I, just okay. relating to, I just did this the other day. So crazy. This is good. How yeah. are you guys able to keep it quiet? Uh, so officers lived off post. So I lived out in the, I had a civilian house out in Germany in the hinterlands. I lived up in the woods. It was great. Um, it was funny. We were talking about this the other day. Um, and I still talk to him. <sighs> he would meet me in the back side of the in the back side of the motor pool to go home at night. And then we would literally come in extra early so that no one would see us. And it was, and I was telling her this as I was talking, I was doing some work with Sage USA about you know LGBT service and Military members, especially the LGBT community, and I can say this knowing all of my friends and and talking to others, we purposely excelled at our jobs. Mm. We did it because we didn't want any extra scrutiny that, you know, if we did the best we could at the end of the duty day, you walked away um, and you had a life, but we took our lives, you know, really far and away. And then you came back and you heard everybody else talk about their, their, their triumphs, you know, with uh, partners and hooking up and all this stuff. And of course we had to, you know, uh, my words, you know, gender fuck, whoever we were talking about the heat, the girl with the guy or guy with the girl, you know, backwards. Um, and, and that's just the way you did it. You just found ways around it. You took your life away from 
in Germany, it's called a Kasern. So you took it away from the Kasern and it was great because we traveled far just to be far away from everybody. So I had Europe as my, my background and playground. Wow. Out. How did it feel though, to be, you know, you've got this, you're doing a double life basically. So yes. yeah. I don't, like how yeah. long did the double life go on for in the military? Until the end. Yeah. Even with Don't Ask, Don't Tell, because a lot of people thought, and it's okay, that they thought, okay, it was lifted. You could do whatever you want. No, 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 no. Remember, especially as we're going to talk about my story, UCMJ, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, is enforced by a commander. That myriad of multiple individuals and personalities and backgrounds and biases, commanders. Um so, you know, you just didn't openly walk in that day and say, you know, hey, I've got a boyfriend or I like boys. You know, you just didn't do that. And you still did not even today because you're still, you know, at the whim of an individual who happens to be your commander who could have some deep biases. The only thing now is that they just can't come after you specifically for that. But we've had that experience, uh, as we've talked maybe once before, uh, Brandon Gutierrez was a kid in the Air Force in Colorado that I worked with during his uh, court martial. And actually he was acquitted. I remember his one. name. Yep. Yep. yep, yep. And Ben Young, you know, great doc. I, he, I just love Ben. Um, ben flew in, you know, as the infectious disease expert, obviously what she is in the world. So it was, it was funny as they tried to, uh, as a prosecution tried to, you know, kind of chink away at his expert status. It was, you know, a lost cause for them to even try to attack Ben. But anyway, so Ben talked to him about U equals U, gave him the whole lowdown about, you know, there's just no way you could pass this on. And then it became that he said, he said, and he was acquitted. And here's why we're talking about that. It was weeks after that the little commander who had pressed charges against him via HIV bullshit, excuse me, mm -hmm. but then later on discharged him for other issues, non, non we call it non-judicial punishment and chaptered him out of the Air Force. So there are still plenty of ways that these very bigoted, homophobic SOBs can come after us. Um, so that's why I said right to the end, no one really, I was never out to anybody at work, except for other gay people that I knew. And we were a little click. Yeah, we were a little click. We had a little coffee group in the Pentagon. It was hilarious. <laughs> we, would meet, we would meet up in the corners, you know, and there'd be this very large eclectic group. But even in the Pentagon, everybody knew like, oh my God, why is there... You know, everybody from every service and senior civilians and some very senior ranking people, they're having coffee on Thursdays, you know, and I'm telling you, we're just a nosy bunch and we would have to move it around. And it was hilarious. It was Do you think it's more acceptable for a woman to be gay in the military than a man? No, I'll tell you, I think no. I oh. think no. So, you know, the military is, of course, a very male dominated uh, uh, employment and culture. Um. You know, we still celebrate, obviously, women Women are equal and can do anything. We've just now had our first, um, over, over the last five years, our first female infantry soldiers, um, you know, Air Force pilots, uh, Army pilots, all of these firsts and barriers breaking down. Um, here we go. The new Secretary of the Army nomination is first female, um, which I'm excited about. She comes from my world and the force management side. So hopefully she's going to be the one that's going to hear my plea. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm excited about that. Yeah. So take me back. When did the shit hit the fan? So shit hit the fan in 2008. When like in the reason I, I'm kind of reluctant, not reluctant telling you, but it was like, it was normal. And for, 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 you know, mid-level. So colonels, you know, general officers, anybody working on some of these big strategic projects, it was not unusual for you to be called in for some type of investigation that was going on with possibly a contract, possibly, you know, um, some, um, some contract entity doing something, even people in your command or in your unit, of course, in the Pentagon, there was an exposure to all kinds of stuff. So it was an AB. We get a phone call. I've got to go to CID. Um, they didn't tell me reason. And I never even thought twice about it. Never. I mean, it, I can still remember this. Uh, I go up there and what was normal is he always called the poor little kid over at the trial defense and it's not trial. It's just the defense attorneys have their own little command. 
So normally you never go alone. You say, hey, look, I got a call. Can someone go with me? And they have to. They always go with you, whether it was for something like what they did to me or for anything else, you always go in with an attorney, whether it's against you or you're part of it or you're just an associate. So this kid goes with me, um, Matt Kempkis. Oh, he was great. And we walk in and the CID agent tells us there is a anonymous complaint against me, reference HIV. Anonymous. In the military, in, in any legal proceeding whatsoever, you get told that there's an anonymous complaint against me. So Matt Kempkis jumps right in and he was pretty funny. He had had a bad day. He was in a bad mood and ripped this poor little investigator to shreds. You know, I mean, F-bombing him. Literally, I mean, he was professional, but it was like, you're not doing this shit. You don't come in here and tell a colonel out of the building that there's an anonymous complaint. We know what it is. And until you can tell us what it is, we're out of here. Um, well, out of here turned into almost four years later. They, they drug this thing out. Um, later, we found out there were seven prosecutors who were presented my case, and they all dropped it. And a term that I learned amongst attorneys, specifically amongst prosecutors, is they call them dog cases. That dog don't hunt. There was no, there was no evidence the case had gone nowhere. It was sitting on someone's desk for those, you know, almost four years and seven others had dropped it. So fast forward to 2011, um, we get notified that they're going to press charges against me. I find out that it was a kid who was in there and I've been saying his name. So you can either, you can, Chris Hamilton was a young Lieutenant that um, was in my home in the Christmas uh, of 2008 with my entire family present. He had called and said, and I, sadly, I knew his father. Um, his father had just retired. He was going over as a civilian to go to the US Army Europe. That was a, he was stationed there for a long time in his career and had retired in the States and was going back over as a civilian. His mother was a nurse and flying back and forth on Iraq medical missions. He had no place to go. Now he had just been introduced to me that summer once. I met this kid once in my life with his then boyfriend, who was a friend of mine, who was a Marine Corps officer stationed in San Diego. So for people to understand this picture, here's a Marine Corps officer in San Diego. Here's an army lieutenant in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And then there's Ken Pinkella up in the Pentagon. So nowhere near each other. It was the, the gay connection. Chris was, uh, as it was always told um, up front, was afraid and had some real misgivings about his first deployment. He had a company commander who was giving him a, a ration of shit when it really turned out to this guy was just being hard on his lieutenants, making sure they understood what they were going into with SOFA agreements. And it was just such a really different battlefield for young officers to walk into. And that's how we were introduced. Those two were dating, which I didn't find out until later, didn't matter. I didn't know Chris. Chris was introduced to me once. Um, we went to a diner. We didn't go to my home, anything else. Um, all correspondence after that for a few months, literally, because that's in August of 2008. He's in my home December of December, like 28th. I have to go back now. It's been so many years. But he was only in my, in my house for less than 18 hours. And we know that because during discovery, we got his cell phone records and all that stuff. He was never alone. My family was there when he called, asked, can he come up? Because you didn't want to spend the holidays alone. Specifically, it was going to be the New Year's holiday. I asked my family, told them who he was. They said yes, like we with anything else. Um, and he came up. He showed up late. Um, when he showed up, he went out to actually see another friend of his. But he had told me he had nowhere else to go. But when he shows up at my house, he has a friend he's going to go see. So my mother, this is the other thing, my mother is involved in this. My mother had to testify. My mother and I put blankets and pillows downstairs on a huge Ottoman couch um, that when he came home, I had push button, you know, those new schlegs, the push button door, uh, door keys, instead mm -hmm. of having a key, we gave him the code to the front door. When he came back, I'm upstairs. And here's this other thing that I, I find it fun to tell people. Not only was my whole family there, there were two Weimaraners and a poodle in the house. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, two, if anybody knows Weimar honors as hunting dogs and a poodle, who was my grandmother's who had died and she was already, the dog was just, you know, on her last legs, you know, half blind. So you couldn't sneeze without the poor thing freaking out. I mean, barking. 
Uh, right. if, anybody, if anybody had walked into my home and came upstairs to my room, two Weimaraners and a poodle would have went batshit crazy. So we had three four-legged alarms plus coming in. So I, 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 that was a big deal. All this stuff was at trial. We tried to say he couldn't have come in my home and came upstairs. And he even admitted how he'd left. So he'd come in. He was on the couch. When mom and I came downstairs the next morning with dogs, let him out. He was downstairs. I told him to go upstairs because we were starting our day. He went upstairs. Again, my stepfather's upstairs asleep. You know, we're downstairs. We went out that day to do monument tours. He chose not to go with us. Don't know what he did. I can't trust anything now. Even years later, as we look back at it, we came home. We're having dinner. While we were out, he'd sent me a text message because he'd asked uh, if uh, he was going to be at the commissary in Fort Myer. Did we want anything? We specifically asked him to get us a small bottle of vodka for the holiday. My, my father and I liked vodka drinks. He brought that home. He did not stay for dinner and he leaves. He wasn't in my home for 18 hours. Fast forward to the, to the time when they press charges. Uh, in 2011, I'm told charges are going to be in the military. It's very different. Charges are referred to the commander and the commander makes the decision then to prefer them uh, to a court-martial. He convenes the court-martial. Um, and that court-martial convened in 2012. I was charged at the time with aggravated assault. And the aggravation specifically was my HIV status. Which he which, knew. He knew it, right? Yes. And that's the other piece that is in the record of trial. Adam, who was his Marine Corps boyfriend, knew that I was HIV positive. We come later on after the first time we met, Chris is speaking to me and he's like, well, you know, I found out that I was HIV positive. I didn't know how I confronted him. He told me that Adam had told him that day when we first met, I confronted Adam via email on my Pentagon freaking email account. And that is in as evidence to the court martial that Adam admitted to telling Chris before he ever met me and knew that I was HIV positive. So that is undeniable. And that is, that's where we, years later, now that we are picking the case apart as, oh, by the way, we'll talk about it after this piece, um, the pro bono review of my case actually had some good news last Friday. So we'll talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yes, he knew that I was HIV positive even before he met me. And we had and, that confirmed by the person who told him. Okay, and he's also HIV positive. Yes. Okay. And allegedly, he tests positive in either January or February of 2009, right before he's going to deploy. Now, it's the there is a funny piece. I laugh because I have to. Years later, I'm tired of crying every day. Um, during discovery, we got his... So if you've had an STD or STI, mm -hmm. you had to sit probably with a public health official. And they did contact tracing, something that during COVID now, most people have heard about with this idea of contact tracing. We want to reach out. Have you exposed anybody else to anything? Should we help them get them on care, get them tested, blah, blah, blah. So with the HIV crowd or anybody who's had a sexually transmitted disease, you've probably done that. So we subpoenaed his STD interview. 12 pages later, dude, 12 pages. And I shit you not, I have it. I'll send it to you afterwards so you can see it as your mouth is wide open. I love this. The, the way, so there's an actual abbreviation and you're going to laugh. Um, TNTC. So he does all these contacts. He has all these people he's hooked up with, names and numbers. I'm listed specifically with all this information. He doesn't know anything about anybody else, but I'm listed with all this information on his STD uh, public health uh, contact tracing list. Well, there's so many contacts that the public health official writes this little narrative and then those letters, TNTC, which is actually an official abbreviation for too numerous to count. <laughs> no, you know, but girl, but, but, but you know, I, I can laugh about this now because we're like, th there's no way not to see this as it was discrimination and prejudice that they wanted the last faggot out of the building. They got me and they got me around an HIV charge, but they couldn't even get their ducks in a row to make this even look legitimate. So this kid, and you know what? God bless him. I wish I was having as much sex as he was. Who gives a shit? I didn't care. I don't care. Right. You know, I was not one of them. 
literally not one of them. So I'm the one who was charged because I'm conveniently the only one that he knew that was HIV positive. Oh. So, yeah, gr- run with it now because f- a few times now with the pro bono groups, people have looked at this and went, is this also a, what they would call in the old days, um, you know, the, uh, um, oh God, I just went blank. With the, well, well, no, that, oh yes, the witch hunt, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But they're talking about why he picked me why did Chris pick me? Are you, because you were the only one that was confirmed HIV positive? Yes. And I'm telling you, there's more to this. So mommy and daddy, he was going to have to tell them that he wasn't deploying and he's going to have to tell them why he's going to have, he'd never come out to them. That was another piece of this. that He wasn't out to his parents as he was deploying. So all of a sudden, conveniently, there's more to this. He's going to have to tell mommy and daddy he's gay. He's going to have to tell mommy and daddy he's HIV positive. Has to tell mommy and daddy he's not going to deploy anymore. He could have stayed in the army like I did. I had a wonderful career and got promoted twice, you know, uh, living with HIV because we have access to the best care on the planet via TRICARE, doctors monitoring us all the time, and an annual that the medical facility must deem you fit for duty to stay in the military. Chris could have stayed in the military without a problem. But um, gay panic, that's, I'm sorry, that was the thing. They thought as they are now looking at the case and the record of trial and all these parts that just don't make sense. Is there a little bit of a gay panic, an HIV panic that he needed to blame somebody else? And you can see that. I don't think I've ever told you that. Did you know we had his cell phone uh, records to include his text messages, him bragging to friends of his taking anonymous. Can I, who's this go to? I don't know if you want to, I can say some things that may be crude, but. Oh, no, it doesn't matter. You can say what Okay, I did before. So, it, you know, and who cares? It's a great thing. If you want to go out and get late, go fine. If you're, if you're into anonymous barebacking and loads, go for sure. it, dude. Have fun. Totally. But take responsibility for what you're doing. That's the only thing is all of this comes down to this responsibility and the discrimination and prejudice that still surrounds HIV came around like the prosecutor said, you're HIV positive, so it must have been you. And then we said, no. I didn't touch this kid. I, 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 I it, this is before U equals U, obviously, when Bruce, and I still joke about when it was given birth in the back of the truck, but Bruce is in the campaign, and obviously you're a huge ambassador about the, uh, about the campaign and what it means to live undetectable. Yeah. I had had a very low viral account. And even if you go back and look at it then, I had just started meds within days, literally within days. I think it was like four days, four weeks. I was already undetectable. So even at the level that I was now with time on our hands, I couldn't have, I couldn't have transmitted because if there was no sex, that's the other thing at the trial, he admits and couldn't tell them that if we had sex, not even did we, but if we did. So there's no means likely for anyone to have even exposed him. Because if you remember, that's what they chose to charge me with exposure, not infecting a person i say they took the coward's way out because they didn't have to really under ucmj have any evidence and sadly why you know i fight on the federal side is that very reason you don't need evidence in an hiv crime under ucmj you just need to convince them and if there's enough bias belief they'll convict you of exposure and i still today can't even tell you what the hell exposure means If, in fact, the alleged complaining witness um, can't even say an act or a way that my any bodily fluids, regardless if it was, you know, semen or blood or whatever, how that could have gotten into him at a level that he could have contracted the virus. Um, So that hell happened in 2012. They uh, decided to court martial me. It was a full week trial. Um, very sadly, uh, I was found guilty on my birthday, my 45th birthday, which wow. is why my birthdays have still been pretty hard. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to get over that. It's not, it's a celebration and I've gotten, I've gotten a little better, but it's still just a dark cloud over my head. So um, you were accused in 2008 and court-martialed in 2012? I was under investigation that began in eight. They uh-huh. decided to press charges in 2011 Okay. And then the actual court martial happened in June of 2012. So in, in all that time, I can't imagine the stress you were under, but you're still oh. in the military during that time? 
Yep. Okay. Yep. Oh Going to work every day. Knowing, can't say anything. Yep. knowing full well that you never even touch this guy and you're yep. just like a scapegoat. Yep. yep. Not knowing yep. what your future is. Okay. Yep. So what happens after that? So sadly, you know, and again, and I, and I really do want people to understand there are pieces of this, that this, the case just makes no sense from start to, to finish. So when we had found out they were going to press charges and we knew what it was and we knew who, I had volunteered to do the phylogenetic analysis. The team up at Bethesda, where I was being seen as an HIV patient with that infectious, uh, infectious disease clinic, they're the ones who even told me about it. Say, hey, we've done this before. We can, we, it's a normal test for anybody with HIV because they generally do the phylogenetic analysis to determine which best prophylactic to start you on. Which medication do we work on? Are you already, or does your strain or your uh, chemical makeup have you predisposition to not using some ARTs? Um, so it's standard, it's done all the time, but they also do it because they can see that it's not my HIV versus his HIV virus. Yeah. So that was back in 2008, 2009, they could do it. Now the process has improved even more where they generally would have said legally, the term was, I'm not the source. Now with the improvements in RNA extraction and the improvements in phylogenetics, they literally can get it to the point now where they can say, that's not Ken mm -hmm. by name. They can say, that's not me. So anyway, we volunteered that. We actually hooked them up with a, a great guy. The, the guy down at Baylor University, who was the big infectious disease phylogenetic analysis guy, he told them that absolutely this would, this, this would, uh, rule me out as a source of whoever this person's HIV was. Now, mind you, they were charging me with exposure. When they learned that that would take me out of the loop, they denied it. They said, well, we don't need it. We don't care. We're not going to do it. So again, the commander and the prosecution has the call on that. We, of course, challenged it to the judge and said that, you know, BS, there is medical evidence available, but then you're at the whim of the judge. It wasn't DNA. It was RNA, and it was probably well over their head. They denied that medical evidence, which is wow. we're very lucky to have kept that. And it's called preserving an issue through the trial and then through the appeals. And I'm very grateful. I had a really smart group that uh, that uh, preserved specifically that issue. Um, now, to com you know, complicate all of that, even before any of this started, I had applied for my retirement, and my retirement was signed by my first 06, which in the building would have gone then over to the command and I would have retired. They did it before I even had any charges pressed against me. So someone sat on my retirement illegally. In those words, you sometimes can't use, but in that case, it was illegal. They should have processed my retirement. I had nothing precluding it. I was not under investigation at the time. This wasn't even a thing then. So now we know that they sat on it even before they decided to do anything, which is another good thing for me that I'll tell you in the update. Mm -hmm. So the judge convicts me on my birthday of aggravated assault, um, violations of a safe sex order that I should have told him, which I was like, well, I didn't have sex with him. So what the hell am I going to tell him? I didn't have sex with him. Um, conduct of becoming an officer, dereliction of duty. I mean, they just throw the kitchen sink at you. But sadly, because it was an aggravated assault related to HIV, even though there's no HIV sex crime in UCMJ, it carried a DNA responsibility, which could have put me on a sex offender list, oh, even without even having sex. Yeah. But luckily, but I'm very lucky. I dodged that bullet okay. um, later on when I moved home and New York State looked at it and went, what? And they, yeah. It was an independent review. They had to review the court martial. Like, there's nothing here for us to even think about putting you on a sex offender list. So I was very lucky with that. But what was so weird, usually at court martials, you are, you immediately go into sentencing. There is no like few months later, it happens immediately. So when you're convicted, you literally kind of take a break, you walk back in and you go immediately into sentencing. <laughs> the judge looks at everybody and says, well, you know what? Let's just wrap it up for the day and everybody come back tomorrow. Now, mind you, he's just said that I'm guilty as this, this terrible predator, uh, aggravated assault, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, why don't you go home tonight? We'll come back tomorrow. And, and, and Jennifer, I'm kind of laughing because I can still remember 
the defense is on the right, prosecution on the left. And we all looked at each other. And I, even the court reporter, she looked up and she was like, I can't remember so because she was very emotional. And she looked up and she didn't, it's like, what? What are we doing? Wrapping up for the day? I, yeah. So why would so, he do that? We don't know. We have no idea. To this day, we have no idea why he did that. So it made it even worse. Whatever. So I got a night at home. Um, you know, they waiting take for up. your to see what waiting. your life is going well, to be. Yes. And even at that moment, you don't know. You don't, is he gonna put you in jail? Is he gonna just say, you know, you're senior, I'm just gonna kick you out? I mean, it could have been anything. You know, the prosecution was asking for 18 years. My God. Okay. And years. Chris is there in the courtroom also. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And he's oh, yeah. going to stick to this story. Oh yeah. yeah. Why? Oh, yeah. Why? Yeah. Well, we, yeah. it's obvious he's made this up, but why would he put you through this? So, you know, but so Jennifer, just as we look at, and I think about, I've seen, you know, the, the crap that people send you as we tell our stories. Mm-hmm. Um, th- this is a, a bigger issue for me because within the military justice system, you know, I have someone like a a Senator Jill Brandt, who happens to be one of my senators. Mm -hmm. And for years, she has been working, and rightfully so on one one hand, working to fix what I know as a commander, you know, sexual assault has been handled wrong since the beginning. Mm -hmm. A very male-dominated piece. The incredible sad stories that we have heard about women coming forward and telling their commander or their supervisor that the, the, maybe the XO or somebody else in their line either assaulted them, harassed them, and they are seen as a, well, you, you shouldn't have done that. You invited that kind of deals, or it's just not prosecuted or there's no investigation done. That's a fact to the extent that it happens. Uh, you know, who knows what those numbers truly are, but it is a fact that it happens. We have terrible stories about it. Mm-hmm. But what she doesn't understand and is in the legislation, and you have kids, did you have to teach your kids not to lie? Can you remember them growing up that you kind of had some time in their lives, you had to tell them that you had, you know, tell the truth that, you know, did you do that? Yeah, absolutely. It is human nature. It is a protective instinct. And then sadly, people with other issues, I will use this word to describe Chris. I'm allowed to since my life was ruined as a sociopath. He didn't want to take responsibility for anything he was doing. He didn't have the courage. And on one hand, I can forgive him for that, that he didn't come out to his parents. Um, But if you were having all that sex, good on you. But when you were playing Russian roulette and you got HIV, just roll the dices you, it's a, it's, it was an okay time to do it. You had access to care. You were going to be okay and live a long, natural, healthy life. But he chose to then blame somebody else for his actions. And that's me. And why he picked me, I think the only reason is as new as I was HIV positive. And we know that's true because Adam had told him. So when you put all of my pieces together, and like I said, time, when someone said this to me years ago, I probably could have punched them. Time is on your side. Time will heal things. Of course, I want it yesterday. But with time on my side now, as so many people have been pulling and raking through my record of trial and all this complicated, it's really not complicated. I mean, the facts are there. The reason it doesn't make sense is because it should have never been done. They put together a very biased case they now have their own government witness when Elliot Henney, a kid that I, you know, had played around with for years prior, as I'm, and I'm HIV negative years ago, they pull him out of the woodwork. And then, you know, he wrote that Title 10 recanting statement and recanted his testimony and by name says that Captain Jordan Stapley, the prosecutor, lied to him, coerced him, and even told him what to say when he got on the stand. That kid exposed himself to his own prosecution by recanting. And I'm so proud of him. It was very hard to sit there and think, why is, why is Scott on the stand? Why is he saying this shit? I'm HIV negative when I knew him. Mm-hmm. I, I, and I didn't see him for years afterwards. I mean, you know, but again, it was the gay man having sex. They tried to make me out as this guy, you know, only having sex with young men. I'm like, really? Okay, can you find anybody else? Because- Sadly, I did have a lot of sex. Um, I wish I did. But, you know, seriously, you think about it, I mean, having a normal life, it was also that hiding factor. I mean, 
I broke up with someone that I will always, you know, regret. Um, when I first moved to DC, I was scared. I was going to be the legislative liaison to Congress. I was going to be scrutinized and I was in the closet and I had this wonderful guy in my life and I ended up, you know, dumping him. And so, I mean, I made choices for the army over my own life of happiness and love. And I look back at what Chris Hamilton chose to do to me. And, and, and I have now, and again, it's my, my choice. Um, there was a, there was a reporter in the courtroom. So his name was, was put out there long before me. So there's no legal exposure here to that for me saying his name, but it's time for me to actually ramp up the scrutiny because one of the things I have said, and I will always say is it seems to be only the innocent invite scrutiny. The, the people who have done stuff and I don't want to be political, but let's use the last four years of the Trump ish stuff in the group of people around him in these people who are flat out so goddamn guilty and they blame everybody else for everything. Well, this is a witch hunt or they're, they're just doing it to come after me. And once the facts are dug up, lo and behold, they did something, but it's the innocent. So I'm already fighting because people think that the conviction happened rightfully that I told Mark King this and Mark has always been emotional when he gets reminded of it. Even within the HIV community, people will kind of just go, well, you must have done something because you, they can't wrap their heads around this idea that, no, this level of stigma and hate around being gay, living with HIV is, is just, it is extraordinary. And sometimes even worse within the gay community itself, regardless of a very male dominated conservative military world. Um, so I went, uh, the next thing we went back uh, I was sentenced to uh, a year in, in jail in Leavenworth and he dismissed me. And it's an actual sentence. He dismissed me for officers. We get dismissed. Um, well, you uh, did I spend was, a, you did spend a year in jail or 272 days. That's because, right. Okay. I remember yes. that now. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's another, that's another nuance that is, and this is great. I actually love that we get to talk about some of these details. Yeah. The judge could have said 366 days. And by the rules, that would have taken all this good conduct time away from me. But he specifically, even though the prosecution's asked for 18 years, even though he should have sentenced me the day before, all these things, and then he says the one year mark, which granted me automatically a bunch of good conduct, time that you get automatically because it's a year or less. Um, it, it was just so, everything about it is so weird. So anyway, I went in with good conduct and then I was the English teacher. So I had a bunch of good conduct time and they wanted me out of there so fast. It was ridiculous. So I ended up going to Leavenworth. Um, I spent 272 days. I got out March 23rd of 2013. Um, and I came home kicking and screaming since then. And that's going to wrap up part one of Ken Pinkella's story. We'll be back next week for a part two. Don't miss it. Find out where Ken's case sits now and what's happened to him since. Thank you so much for listening today. I'll leave links in the description for Ken's video from the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation that he spoke about in the beginning of the podcast, as well as other links pertaining to HIV discrimination. You can also find all my links in the description. If you wouldn't mind taking a moment to rate and review my podcast, I would be so very grateful Thanks again, everyone. I hope you have a stupendous week. Bye-bye.